Okay, uh, I think I am unmuted and I think everyone else is muted. So I will go ahead and start the meeting. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Tim Bray. I'm the president of the Mendocino Coast Audubon Society. And welcome to our monthly chapter meeting and presentation. Uh, and just a few words about how this works, uh, the way we've been doing these Zoom presentations is the only way that we can really manage it is for everyone except the presenter to be muted all the time. So if you have questions during the presentation, use the chat function. In fact, the chat function is a great way to have side conversations without disturbing anyone else. Uh, and then at the end of the presentation, we'll go through that and see if there's questions that we need to answer and address. It's just a little too awkward to try to figure out a way to interrupt the presentation while it's going on. Besides, you're gonna be riveted by all the fascinating information David and I are gonna pass along. Um, I think that's about all I need to say before we really get started. Uh, we'll, we'll talk a little as we go along about the setting here, but as you can see from this opening slide, uh, we are actually having Christmas bird counts this year. Audubon kind of left it up to the individual compilers to decide whether to have one or not. And we figured with the COVID restrictions, it's possible to do it safely. And so that's how we're doing it. And we'll talk a little bit about what those are, uh, but it's pretty much the usual stuff. And of course the birding is an outdoor activity, which is the safest thing we can do right now anyway. A couple of things that we can't do though, we cannot do carpooling. So that really cuts back on how many people can participate because uh, we and it makes logistics of some of these routes challenging because we can't pile a bunch of people into a car to move them around and of course we can't have a count, count dinner and of course my screen isn't working yeah, well, I, uh, I should be able. There we go. So not this year. We will not be able to have this much fun. The count dinner is often the highlight of the day for many of us that do these things regularly. But it's just not possible. So better luck next year. We'll try to have some fun anyway. So just a quick rundown on the count circles before we get into the birds. Uh, and the reason that we're gonna show you this is not so much because we are recruiting, but if you're in the count circle, what we really were are hoping to recruit is a lot of yard and feeder watches. And so this is the circle for the Fort Bragg count, C-A-F-B, which I compile and uh, pay no attention to all the numbers and divisions, but just look at the circle. If you live anywhere within this circle from just south of Mendocino all the way up to Little Valley here on the north, then uh, you can count birds right in your neighborhood, in your yard, or even from your window. And that would be a great way to participate this year. We are gonna need yard Peter watch counts more than ever. And, uh, and then if you wanna be more ambitious, uh, you can probably, count birds in your neighborhood, but that way you have to, you'll have to coordinate that with me to make sure we're not double counting because I do have a few teams going out in the field. Here's David's circle and I'll let him talk about that. Yeah, so this is the Manchester circle. As you can see, uh, it's definitely not as well populated as the Fort Bragg circle. And it reaches from uh, Highway 1 Cuffey's Cove in the north down to uh, just below Mountain View Road in the south, uh, just beyond the Stornetta Ranch. And if you happen to live uh, in any of that stretch, uh, please um, please feel free to join us in the uh, feeder count. That information will be coming up maybe on the next slide or the slide after. Mm -hmm. So uh, we really would appreciate your help this year. Thank you very much. And there's the information to participate in the feeder, feeder count or yard count. 
Johanna has been coordinating this for us for the last couple of years. And I want to thank her a lot because there's quite a bit of wrangling to do to get all the information from people and then funnel it to me Here's the information on the screen, and uh, really hope that people will take advantage of that. Uh, Tim, may I interject here for a second? Um, uh, your your voice is cutting out uh, periodically. Uh, I don't know if it's on my end or if it's on everyone else's end as well. But um, mm, I hope it's not my internet connection being flaky. Okay. You're not using the internet, are you? I'll take. <laughs> Everything. I think I've had that problem in the previous Zoom meetings where my the audio cuts out a little bit from now and time and again. I can tell you it's making it all the way to Seattle fine. Okay, good. Maybe it's, maybe it's, maybe it's me. It might be your connection. There's a lot of internet connections to be made here. All right, well, let's move on from these Siskins. We should point out that... Uh, <laughs> That's what a lot of people are going to be seeing in the yards this year because there's a huge eruption of pine siskins. They're just showing up all over in enormous flocks. Well, we did this last time and it was pretty popular. Uh, just take a moment and guess what the top five most abund ab abundant birds are in the Fort Bragg count. On the opening slide, you could see that we this will be our 10th official count. We did a practice. So we've got 10 years worth of data. And uh, so I went through last year and figured out what are the most consistent, abundant birds that we find year on year. And uh, it was pretty predictable. I think the audience last year pretty much nailed what they were. No surprise that robins are in there, yellow rumped warblers. Crown sparrows, although I suspect this year they're going to fall out of the top five because I think quite a few birds here are not here. And given where we are, western gulls, and because of the mill site, <laughs> the Maybe. common ravens. It's funny because it, every year there's some other bird that kind of shoulders its way into the top five just for one year. Uh, there was one year when I think we had two or three thousand common MERS. Normally we'll get two or three hundred. There was one year when we had three thousand coots. <laughs> and this year I think we'll be doing good to have a hundred. So there's a lot of variability, but these guys are consistent. Birds are everywhere. This is a little video that uh, Holly Madrigal shared with me. And uh, I just liked it because oh, it's not videoing. <laughs> this PowerPoint thing is kind of funny. There we go. <laughs> okay, they're birds and we have to count them. They might be feral, but they're still birds. They're feral pigeons. And uh, they're kind of pretty when they're trying to balance on wires, which they're remarkably bad at doing. And does anybody want to take a guess at how many there are? Just uh, write your number down and we'll get back to it later. So this is what we were just looking at, feral pigeon or common pigeon, uh, the uh, offspring of rock doves. <laughs> Pretty easy to identify because they come in a whole bunch of different colors. Most wild birds don't have quite that much variability. Everybody knows these birds. How about this guy? This one is a little bit harder to find, but we always get them in the Fort Bragg count. This is the native California pigeon, the band-tailed pigeon. Easily identifiable by its enormous body and the band of face and tail. Got a little heavier and more direct flight. Feral pigeons often look like they don't know where they're going, and these guys are very purposeful. And this guy with the long pointed tail is our native dove, the morning dove. 
not to be confused with the invasive and now pretty much naturalized Eurasian collar dove. It has that sort of squared off tail and a heavier body and shorter collar. And they have become, uh, you know, I remember not that many years ago when we first started birding here, these guys were unknown. And then a few years later, the first ones were sighted. It was a big deal. People got really excited. And uh, now everybody's irritated when they see them. And not everybody, I should point out, the Cooper's Hawks think it's just absolutely fantastic that the Eurasian collar doves have become abundant here. Because they're slower and easier to catch than morning. So here's a side by side, just to remind you of the differences. And of course, morning doves don't have that black collar, and morning doves show you that long pointed tail, very different from the collar. Okay, David, over to you. All right, we're going to uh, start looking at the little brown birds. Um, a lot of folks think, you know, they're just LBJs, no big deal. But uh, these are actually a real important and very, very enjoyable group of birds. If you look at this slide, they all kind of look alike, but we can tell them apart by certain key features. Some have got dark heads, some got uh, stripes on their heads. You can tell your sparrows apart. So let's take a look and uh, I guess, Tim, I'll just say uh, next slide. All righty. I'll try and get it to work. The system is a little weird. It is wonky tonight. There we go. All right, so this is um, the most common, arguably most common of all of our sparrows here. This and the song sparrow. This is the white crown sparrow. It's a male or a female. The bird on the right is a young bird. The bird on the left is an adult. They have those bright yellow orange bills and the plain breast. Easy to see, easy to identify. Next slide, Tim. This is another plain breasted bird. This is a gold crown sparrow. I wonder how it got its name. Maybe that gold crown. I want to say real briefly that we're going to go through these sparrows real quickly. I respect the fact that they can be troubling, but we're um, as soon as we iron out some technical difficulties, we'll be posting uh, a tutorial video on our YouTube. Uh oh. Yeah, see, I think oh, it's so internet. Please, don't be frustrated. I got a note that my internet connection's unstable. Okay, are we with, the, am I with you again? Yeah, you are, okay. That, okay. That clears it up. I wasn't sure if it was yours or mine. So, um, Visit our YouTube channel for greater details on the sparrows. Next slide, please. Another set of plain-breasted sparrows. These look a lot like the uh, white crowns. These are white-throated sparrows. These are becoming more and more common in our area. Um, unlike the white-crowned, um, the white-throated sparrows, uh, that's not an adult on the left and a young bird on the right. They come in these two different color morphs. Judging by the yellow in the face, they're probably both adults. So again, these are the white-throated sparrows. They are only here in the winter. Next slide. And we've got three uh, striped sparrows as well. The bird down the bottom, is the most common, it's the song sparrow. The upper, the bird on the uh, upper left is a savanna sparrow. The savanna sparrow's uh, distribution here on the coast is kind of unique in that you'll find the savanna sparrow almost exclusively right along the edge of the ocean. If you get 100 or 200 yards inland, they stop. So look for this bird right along the bluffs. The thing you to notice about this bird is, and it doesn't show up well in this slide, but there's a yellow wash in the face. Also, subtle point, this is a much lighter sparrow than is that dark song sparrow on the bottom. Those two birds, though, will be here year round, so you can get to know them quite well. Now this bird in the upper right is only here in the winter. This is the Lincoln Sparrow. 
Notice that gold wash, it looks a lot like the song sparrow, they're cousins. But notice that gold wash up in the, uh, underneath uh, what we call the malar stripe, the jawline, and across the upper breast, it has a fantastic little gold wash to it. It's a small bird, very, it's lovable. Next slide. And we got three sparrows here that are a little bit larger than the, than the six that we've seen to date. One on the top, and, they, and they, the one on the top is a fox sparrow. It's not really striped, it has little chevrons or dots all over the front of the breast. And the thing to notice about the fox sparrow, look at the back. In fact, all three of these birds share one trait in common, and that's that their backs are uniform color. All the other sparrows, the six sparrows that we saw previously, all have a coat of many colors on their back. These don't. These all have a uniform homogeneous coloration to their back. The fox sparrow is a winter visitor. He, he's the champion of the double scratch, the, the way they uh, jump forward and back, forward and back, and uncover food. Um, he'll cover up your, your walkway with dirt and mulch. The bird directly below it is actually not even a sparrow. That's a, a thrush, a hermit thrush, but it can easily be confused with the sparrows because it it shows up in the same places doing pretty much the same things in the winter. But what, as like Tim likes to point out, the hermit thrush does a beautiful little twinkle with its wings. It, 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 um, it jerks its wings and it does a little twinkle. Uh, again, though, it has a uniform colored back and a reddish colored tail. So the back and the tail are two different colors. Finally, the bird on the far right is a bird that is seldom seen here on the coast. This is the brown, or excuse me, the California towhee. We pick it up down in uh, outside, just outside of Mendocino. We pick it up in Irish Beach. If you go to Willits or Ukiah, they're everywhere. So that's the California towhee. Next slide, Tim. I'll hand it over to you, sir. We, uh, we decided we would start this presentation with the yardbirds, and this is a classic yardbird, along with most of those sparrows. Uh, those hermit thrushes often show up in people's yards too. And this little guy is a great yardbird. This, of course, is the black Phoebe. And uh, just from this photograph, you can see they're not shy about making use of human alteration in the landscape. They are perch and sally hunters and uh, pretty abundant birds around here. If you've got a yard with any insects in it, you've got one of these. Well, back to you, David. These are your finches. Yeah, these are uh, another, another set of little brown birds, particularly the female on the right. These are house finches, and these are uh, the, the males on the left. It's basically a little brown bird that has some red in the face and the upper breast a little bit of red on the tail, but at heart, it remains a little brown bird. Um, the female, what's notable about the female is those stripings in the flanks between the, the flanks between the wing and the, and the leg. Um, those brown stripings clearly identify it as a house, female house finch, as we'll see in the next slide. Tim, next slide, please. Thank okay, you, there we go. Thank you, sir. Now these are very similar, but very different to the house finches. These are purple finches. The female purple finches on the left this time, the male purple finches on the right. The purple finches are different from the houses in that that red is not just limited to some spots on the top of the head and the breast and a little bit on the rump. It, that red is kind of tinted all over that bird. And um, you don't notice it very much in this slide, but there's a, a pronounced superciliary stripe over the eye of the male and the female. The male, it's kind of masked with that purplish tint. 
the female, that broad white superciliary stripe is quite obvious. You will not see that on a house finch. Their bills are bigger. And uh, we'll move on to the next slide. That's my phone. Sorry about that. Here's a close up of the male purple finch. Now you can see that broad uh, white superciliary stripe I was talking about. Superciliary is, is bird speak for uh, eyebrow stripe. <laughs> um, it's, there's a big white eyebrow stripe that kind of carries that. Um, th yeah, and it is eating a sunflower seeds. Finches have robust seed eating bills, and the purple finch has. A, ro a bill that's much more robust than the, uh, the smaller house finch. You see the male house finch is on the left, and you, you can see from this that that red is really limited. Unlike the purple, the red is, is, is distinct in certain areas. Next slide. Yeah, before we leave those guys, the mnemonic I always like on purple finches, um, I can't remember if it was Peterson or which of the field guys this Peterson. as being like a sparrow that was dipped in raspberry juice. And uh, it's kind of true. If you imagine holding one by the tail and dipping it and then holding it upside down while the juice dried, it's brightest red on the head and then it's kind of fades all the way down to the tail. Really different pattern from the house finch. Again, here's a, a shot of the females. Which one do you think is on the left? House finch. The bird on the right, female purple finch. One quick word about the songs. The song, they both have a, a, a melodic finch, so, finch song. The house finch is kind of like the Canada goose. They love to sing when they fly. In fact, they, they, in, especially in the spring, they very seldom fly quietly. They're always talking about something. It's a long, protracted song, whereas the purple finch has a very beautiful melodic song that ends before you really want it to. It's, it's short, sweet, and it goes. Okay, next slide. Size, somebody said something about size. They, these are, um, they're small birds. They're uh, slighter than the sparrows that we saw. And the purple finch is heavier um, than the house finch. The house finch is slighter, a smaller bird than the purple finch. That said, neither one of them is as big as a robin. They're both relatively small. Yeah, the, really the, uh, in the field, the best way to tell them apart is that face pattern. Yeah, that, super, that white superciliary eyebrow stripe. Yep, that's, that's the sign for your purple finch. Tim, I'll let you take your favorite crossbill here. <laughs> yeah, tough bird to find around here. Um, this is the red crossbill, even though it's not red. Uh, most of them are, or at least most of the males are red, but uh, a lot of times the young ones are yellow, this bird, but those crossbills are pretty unmistakable. Uh, they're very hard to find and they are, a treetop bird. So even when you do find them, a lot of times they're really hard to see. It's pretty easy to overlook them. So what you have to do is listen for them. Let's see if I can get this to work. I'm not hearing it. Are you hearing the call? No. Well, I wonder why. Unfortunately not. Microsoft just decided not to do that anymore, apparently. Mm -hmm. I don't, I think. It's not, nope, it's all Are you our computer sound. No, this was working just a tiny little while ago. Well, I'll, uh, I'll just imitate them. Uh, they go, they have a uh, double jip call. They go jip, 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 when they're flying. And it's real sharp and metallic sounding. Uh, sometimes there's different races and they sound slightly different. And uh, the ones I hear in the pygmy sometimes go chink, 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 but it's always a double or sometimes three. And when you get a small flock of them, it's really distinctive. They fly like finches and they chatter like finches, but they make that little chink, 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 chink sound. 
and that'll alert you to their presence and you can look up. One more finch, David, you wanna talk about these little guys? Yeah, I'd love to talk about them. <laughs> I've got them bouncing off my windows like so many uh, flies. This is a finch that doesn't call itself a finch. This is a siskin, a pine siskin. What's remarkable about this bird, what's different about this bird is look at the bills. We've been looking at, uh, except for that crossbill, which has a, you know, a bill for Mars, it's crazy. Um, <laughs> the other finches and sparrows have these heavy seed eating bills. This bird has a real uh, pointed bill, sharp pointed bill. Look at all the striping on the bird. Now, someone mentioned something about size a minute ago in the chat. These birds are small. These birds, uh, if you put five of them together, they, they weigh maybe an ounce. They're incredibly light. They're small. They have uh, a lot of striping. They have a little bit of a purple wash to the uh, stripes in the wings. We will go uh, several years, two, three, sometimes maybe four years without seeing these birds. They live up in uh, Canada, up in the northern tier of the U.S., and um, when their seed supply is adequate, they don't bother coming down. This is one of those years when the, the seed supply is at a low and they've just descended in huge numbers into the lower 48. And um, they'll eat black oil sunflower. They love the heck out of uh, Niger thistle seed. And um, they're very, very common right now uh, in our area. You want to add anything, Tim? No, just to echo what you said, they're, they're not just common, they're abundant. Their numbers are enormous. We had a single flock at the Botanical Gardens last Wednesday that we estimated had 100 birds in it. I'll add, I'll add one more thing about this bird. And, and if you get them, you'll, you'll notice this. Um, there are many, many, many of them. And uh, some of them seem to be young and arguably they might be weak, but they will sit on the ground and you can walk right up to them. Hmm. Um, and I, I have a, a, a small terrier and um, he will walk up and pick them off the ground in his mouth. And uh, so it's a great little bird, but they're really disposable. They, uh, it's a good thing there are so many because not all of them last the winter. So uh, we'll move on on that note. Okay, I'm just gonna answer a question that just came up in, in chat about the crossbills. And uh, what's, the, uh, what's the purpose of that weird bill on red crossbills? Uh, and it does in fact have an evolutionary uh, rationale. They use those to pry open pine cones and pop the seeds out. And uh, it's a very specialized adaptation. And that is why they move around so much. It's why they're hard to find. We, uh, Ecology Hour, we had a scientist a couple of months ago talking about uh, the crossbills and it explained why we will see them sometimes here. And then you can bird all over the coast trying to find them for a couple of years and you can't find any. And it's because they range extremely widely. They, uh, they will, individual birds and flocks might travel for hundreds of miles in search of food. And they roam around all the time because they have a specialized food source. They need those closed cone pines and spruces. All right. Yellow on the wings of these siskins, that's correct. That is Yeah, great. exactly. And uh, they're kind of like, they're kind of sparrow-like, but they have those big wing bars and they flash a lot of yellow when they fly. They're actually pretty cool birds. They really are. They just eat too much niger thistle. And they're too susceptible to salmonella. They're way too. Okay, here's, uh, here's our other two much more common finches. Um, these are finches in winter. The, the birds on the left are American goldfinch. These are the birds that are bright yellow in the summer with the black caps. 
they fly and sing out potato chip, 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 potato chip, 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 chip. Um, in the winter, they lose that bright yellow color. And I don't know what that color is across their back. I don't know that there's even a name for it, but it's, it's beautiful. The birds on the right are lesser goldfinch. And unlike the American goldfinch, they retain their yellow bellies and chests, and they re the males retain their black cap throughout the winter. So they stay bright and yellow, the lesser goldfinch and the American goldfinch um, turn this winter color, but they retain those really strong black and white wing markings, wing bars. So um, Tim, do you want to say something about under the tail or do you want to move on? I think just the, you know, yeah, there, there is a difference, but it's subtle and hard to see. It's easier to just see if you've got lesser goldfinches, they're going to show that yellow color and yep. the Americans are all kind of buffy, that kind of nice soft brown color with yep. really prominent wing bars. Just this slide really highlights the differences. And uh, the only thing I'd add is lesser goldfinches used to be quite rare here on the coast. It was really, it was great when you could find some. And they seem to be becoming more common here and more regular. And keep your eye out for lesser goldfinches now on the coast. And at the same time, the American goldfinches seem to be getting rarer. It's harder and harder to find any of those at all. I have no idea what's behind those changes. Uh, and we'll just have to see as the years go by whether it, the trend continues. That's one of the reasons we do these Christmas bird counts is to generate the data so we can see trends in populations like that. Okay, I'm gonna take this one. This is one of my favorite birds. And again, a bird that used to be quite rare here on the coast and uh, is now resident year round here in a few places. And it seems like maybe their population is increasing a little, little bit. This is a, a classic town bird. This is a Northern Mockingbird. And uh, I, I probably could have put one of their calls in here, but we'd be here all night because they have an insanely long repertoire of calls. And uh, the thing to notice, they're the size, approximately the size and shape of a J, but they stand differently. They hold their tails up like this one, their tails up and their wings down. It's the classic Northern Mockingbird pose. And around here, primarily found in town, there's several of them in Fort Bragg now, and there's some in Mendocino. And uh, the other thing to look for is those white wing patches. You can see a little bit of it when they're perched like this, but when they're out hunting for insects, they look like this. This one's in my yard uh, last year. And they raise those, they raise their wings and display those white patches. Nobody's quite sure why, but it's something they do while they're foraging and looking for insects. The theory is that it makes the insects move so the bird can find them easier. Okay, here's a bird that we get lots of in the spring and summer, and most of them migrate away, but not all of them. And so there's still some hanging around. Uh, this is a bird a lot of people love to hate. This is a male on the upper left, female on the lower right, and it's a brown-headed cowbird. Uh, a fascinating bird to me, evolutionarily, they are what's called a nest parasite. They don't make their own nests. They lay their eggs in the nests of other birds. This was an adaptation to life on the road. They used to be, uh, they are badly named. They evolved and adapted to life going buffalo herds. And most specialized adaptations like that result in extinction when your, uh, your niche disappears and the buffalo disappeared and the cowbirds, instead of disappearing, spread all over North America. <laughs> they found out that not w spending all that energy and time building a nest and raising your own young frees you up to move around and reproduce a lot. And they have done so very successfully. But you keep an eye out for these guys, the males with their, the males look like a blackbird, except they have that, that uh, bronzy brown head, hence the name brown headed cowbird. Females are trickier because they're really drab, but they have that great big finch like beak. 
So you look for a, something that looks kind of like a blackbird, but has a finch beak. That's a brown-headed cowbird. Tim, the other feature in the brown-headed cowbird that really shows well on, on uh, phone wires is the, uh, their tails are cut short. Their tails will be noticeably shorter than all the blackbirds that they're hanging out with. So look for the blackbird with a short tail. That's um, in bad light, that's the really easy way to see them. Another interesting footnote about the brown-headed cowbird is, you know, their young are raised by, oh, other, I've seen uh, little Wilson's warblers feeding great big cowbird chicks. So normally birds grow up and learn much about who they are from their parents, and then they'll follow their parents around once they fledge. Cowbirds don't have that option. When they're done being fed by the host bird, they're on their own. And how do they, how do they identify themselves as cowbirds and come together uh, for the purposes of breeding? It's an interesting question. And uh, in our area, you'll see small groups of immature cowbirds in midsummer. Somehow they find each other and recognize the fact that they're not uh, hermit warblers. They're not house finches. They're not robins. They're cowbirds. So they all come together. So more than you wanted to know, I'm sure. <laughs> no, they really are a remarkable bird in terms of evolution and adaptation. They have several really amazing things about them. I kind of admire them. A lot of people hate them. Mm -hmm. All right, moving on. This is a bird that throws a lot of people off. This is this could be a really tricky one to identify. Uh, take a guess if you don't already know what this bird is. Um, the this is a female, and the male would be instantly recognizable. The males are very obvious because they are a black bird with bright red shoulder patches. So this is a female red-winged blackbird, uh, and they are streak. They are dark brown and streaky, and they will really throw you off because they look nothing at all like the like the adult, the males. <laughs> all right, let's see if I can get to the next one. Okay, this is uh, not a red-winged blackbird, but it's very close. This is a tricolored blackbird, which I think used to be classed as a race of tricolored, but is now a separate species. And they're, uh, they're, have, they're a species of some concern in California. Their habitat is getting wiped out. And so their numbers are declining. We do get them here in the, in the uh, wintertime. They don't breed here. They breed mostly in the Central Valley. And a few of them come over here for the winter. I don't blame them. And so watch for that pure white stripe on the shoulder. It shows up really well, just like in this picture. So you see a group of blackbirds or a group of red-winged blackbirds, look through them and see if there's one or two that have these pure white patches on the side of their wing. Frequently, you don't see the red, you just see the white. We don't get tricolored every year, so they're a good find. Okay, I love this shot. Uh, this is one of the most common and abundant birds. It's somewhat surprising they're not in the top five. Yes, these are Canada geese, except one of them. One of these is not like the others. So take a look and see. First of all, you've got to count all these birds. And when you do, when you start counting them, you'll notice one of them doesn't look like the others. The third bird from the left at the top is... Smaller. Yeah, it's less than half the size of the uh, other ones. So the others are Canada geese, also known as honkers. And that little guy is a cackling goose, which is now actually a separate species. And so we count that separately. So you- I always wonder the difference between the two. Let's go back to that. Yeah, the difference is mainly size. The, the cacklers have a couple of other differences. Their necks are shorter um, and uh, their wing beats are a little faster, but those things are kind of subtle and hard to see. What's easy to see is the size differential. And we do have these guys on the coast. Uh, in fact, there was a big flock of them went over the mill site just the other day when we were out there. They're, oh. they're different too. 
So whenever you see a, a little flock, of, uh, either little or big, a flock of Canada geese fly by, take a moment and look real close and see if there's a little one sneaking along with them. Okay, David, it's warbler time. Over to you. All right, warblers. <clears throat> I love the little birds. I'm sorry, but I'm unapologetic. I love little birds. And uh, these are fantastic little birds. This is, uh, I believe, one of the most common birds on our Christmas counts, both Fort Bragg and Manchester. They're here in the winter in great numbers. And um, I, they are yellow rumped warblers. Um, they used to be known as Audubon warblers and um, myrtle, war myrtle warblers, I believe. It's been a while since I've called them that. I hope to goodness that they never split them because uh, it's gonna, if they ever split them into two groups and we have to tell which is which, it's going to be very, very difficult because uh, the two look very similar. They're small brown birds. The males have that real bright yellow. They can have that real bright yellow under the, under the throat. And they get their name from that yellow rump patch in the bird on the uh, lower right. They're commonly called uh, butter butts um, <laughs> because it looks like a big pat of butter sitting right on top of their butt. So. Um, the uh, myrtle warbler tends to be lighter colored under the throat. Um, another thing you'll notice that these birds eat a lot of, uh, I wish I'd studied botany, they eat a lot of a certain type of uh, coarse berry here on the coast. Somebody will probably chat the name of that berry. Um, oh, I think it's, um, don't they eat the berries on uh, wax myrtle trees? Wax myrtles. Yeah, yeah, wax myrtles. They they love wax myrtles. So they have anyway, a, they have an enzyme they can digest that waxy coating. There you go. Yeah. One one thing you'll notice if you watch these birds, one thing you'll notice is they have a zigzag flight, particularly as they approach uh, their perch. They'll all of a sudden just bolt off to the side. Most birds will fly in a straight line. These guys are very agile and they'll zigzag back and forth as they get ready to land. Okay, that's about all I have to say about them. Yeah, just that they're super abundant and you'll find lots and lots of them this year. And they're gone in the summer. They, these guys will not be here in the summer. They are strictly uh, a winter warbler for us. This is their good looking cousin. This is the Townsend's <laughs> warbler. <laughs> this has always been mama's favorite. Um, it's a gorgeous little bird, and you'll notice that it, bright yellow in the face with the black striping, and the yellow kind of pulls down onto the breast a little bit. Um, you'll find uh, 100 yellow rumps and one Townsend. Uh, they're greatly outnumbered, and yet they're, um, they're relatively easy to find here in the wintertime. The places I go to, if I... If I wake up in the morning and say, I just got to see a Townsend's, I go either to Rose Memorial Cemetery in Fort Bragg and look at the, um, look at the trees there, the, help me out, Tim. Banksias. The Banksias with those uh, fluorescences. Yeah, and, those bottle brush flowers, yeah. Yeah, or else I go to the botanical gardens. And again, I look at the, look through the Banksia tree there uh, just beyond the cactus garden, right next to the heathers. And um, if I wait maybe 10 minutes, I'm going to find a Townsend's. Again, only in the winter, though. It's a beautiful little bird. They also will sometimes join a, a mixed flock or guild in the, in the woods. If you, yes. If you find chickadees and kinglets and nut hatches and maybe a downy woodpecker, and you keep looking around, you'll often find one of these guys hanging around with the other birds. Here's a tricky one. Go ahead, David. What do you guys think? <laughs> this is... Yeah, this I, don't is see a, uh, I don't see a lot of guesses on the chat right now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is a bird, like another one we're going to come to in a minute, that's 
appropriately named, but you don't appreciate it at first. <laughs> This is the orange crowned warbler. You see that orange crown? No, you don't. Yeah. Because it's not showing it right now. It's there though. It's very subtle. The next bird with a crown that we're going to talk about is much more obvious than this one. This is a year round bird. It breeds here, it winters here. It's a warbler. It's a small bird with a long pointed bill. It gleans insects. And the thing that you'll notice about this bird is it's kind of uh, yellow green mm -hmm. and there's an intimation, there's a hint, sometimes quite noticeable, of a dark stripe through the eye. Uh, I, you can kind of, if you take your eyes out of focus, you can see it on this bird, but oftentimes in the field, but the only thing you'll notice is I think I see a dark stripe through the eye. I'll bet that's an orange crowned warbler because there are no other real keys. Yeah. Okay. They're tricky to find. They are warblers, so they skulk around in the cover and move rapidly, and they're hard to get a bead on. We only ever, on the Christmas count here, generally get like two or three of them found, and that's with 50 or 60 people looking for them. So they take some looking for to find them. Well, here's an obvious one. This is a bird I think probably everybody knows. Uh, very much a bird of the coastal forest. This is the chestnut back chickadee. And they are great talkers. You can hear them chattering in the trees. The great thing about these guys in winter, in the winter birding, is uh, I mentioned earlier about guilds. And these are often the first birds you hear and see in a, in a guild in the woods when you're out birding and you find chickadees and you just stop and start scanning through uh, the rest of the territory around these birds. And often there will be other species of songbird that are tagging along with them. And that's because uh, in the winter, we get a certain kind of raptor that we'll talk about in just a few minutes that poses a real threat to songbirds. And so they kind of band together for protection. They have more eyeballs and uh, it helps them stay alert and see the raptors coming. So these are great little birds to kind of clue you in to other birds, like these. <laughs> okay, here, now this is another one. Uh, David mentioned earlier that we're, we've been working on a series of tutorial videos to put on our YouTube channel. And by the way, this presentation is gonna go up on, you, on our YouTube channel as well, if you just go to YouTube and look for Mendocino Coast Audubon, you should find us. And I've got a tutorial that I just put up today, uh, just about a 10 minute long job, to help you work out the difference between these two birds. And believe it or not, these are two completely different species uh, that look almost identical. This is the ruby crowned kinglet on top and the Hutton's vireo on the bottom. Uh, the ruby crown kinglet is a wintertime visitor. We don't have them in the summer. The Hutton's Vireo is a year-round resident. They, they breed here, in fact. Now, what I had hoped to do was play their calls here, but I don't think that's working now. No, it is not. You'll have to go to the YouTube video where the calls are working. <laughs> and you, the, because that's my number one way to tell these birds apart. Their vocalizations are completely different, and they both talk a lot, especially the ruby crown kinglet. They chatter almost constantly while they're feeding in the woods. Um, and the Hutton's vireo has the famous vireo sneer. This nasty little noise. And kinglets sound like somebody uh, typing out a manifesto with two fingers on an old IBM Selectric typewriter. For those of you that can remember what a manual typewriter sounded like. The other thing, visual clues you can see on these birds, uh, the ruby crown kinglet on the top, you see that black bar behind the white bar on their wing. And you look at the wing on the Hutton's Vireo, they have two white bars and a dark patch in between. Uh, the, um, the bill shape is a little different. The lores, the area between the eye and the bill on Hutton's Vireo, that's pale. And on ruby crown kinglets, it's the same color as the rest of their head. And believe it or not, their feet 
are a pretty good clue. You can see the Hutton's Vireo down there, their feet are a bluish gray, the same color as their legs. And ruby crown kinglets have those brown legs and bright yellow feet. And believe it or not, you can actually see that in the field sometimes. So yeah, the YouTube video is a great, uh, I, I really go into some depth about that and uh, it'll help you. The Hutton's Vireo is probably undercounted here because they're a little, kind of an inconspicuous bird. Kinglets are not inconspicuous. They are right up in your face and we see a lot of them on account. This is the other kinglet. This is the golden crown kinglet, appropriately named. This is a very unusual photograph because it's looking down on one, on the back of one. Normally all you see is their underside because they inhabit the canopy, the very tops of trees. And uh, you frequently only hear them. And that only if you're younger than me. Uh, I can still hear them, but I'm just counting the days to when I no longer can hear golden crown kinglets. They have extremely high pitched calls, little kinkly noises that they make way up high in the canopy of a tree. Beautiful little birds though, and they form little flocks. So you scan the canopy, you might get a glimpse of these guys moving around up there. Here we go. Nut hatches. Okay, so we have one permanent resident here and one occasional visitor uh, who is quite welcome when they do come here. So the one on the bottom is our permanent resident, the pygmy nut hatch. And uh, they make little panicky calls. Like Morse code when they're moving around in the treetops. And they will sometimes come down low in the winter where you can see them clearly. And then the red breasted uh, with that black and white badger face. Very beautiful, very striking birds. And they have a very different call that carries through the woods. Over and over and over again. They are primarily a bird of conifer forests and uh, they're abundant in the Sierra Nevadas. They're not resident here, but in eruption years, when they spread out looking for food, we, uh, we will sometimes get a bunch of them here on the coast. I haven't seen very many this year or heard them at all, so I'm not sure that we're gonna get them this year. It's worth looking for them. Yeah, they're, the, the Red-breasted is a little bit like a white-breasted nut hatch call. They're different, but they're more similar to that. Pygmies sound completely different. They have that uh, like Morse code little panicky noises they make to each other. And then this is another bird that often joins guilds. Um, I, I frequently say that you'll have the, the guild is stratified and you have golden kind kinglets at the top and these guys at the bottom. This is brown creeper. And they work their way up tree trunks like a woodpecker, poking that little bill into everything. And while they're doing it, they make another high-pitched call uh, that a lot of people can't hear. Uh, but it's a two-note call, very clear notes. And uh, the way I think of it is they're saying, trees, 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 trees. And you listen for that double, double call and look around. They're hard to find. They blend in, as you can see. Uh, but they're fun to watch. This is another bird of the of the woods. Uh, in fact, you can find this in the deep woods, down in the dark in the redwood forest. This is the varied thrush, and uh, they're somewhat robin-like, but they're larger than robins and much more spectacularly colored and marked. Um, again, I wish I could get the calls to work, but I'd have to stop the presentation, I think, to fix that. So we'll just carry on. They make the strangest call. Um, primarily in the morning, you hear it kind of echoing up out of the canon, canyons. And it sounds like somebody whistling and humming simultaneously. Uh, an odd metallic kind of mechanical sound. If you see one, they're unmistakable. They're a little uh, worse this year. Jim. Yeah, David. Let me give this a try, my friend. Let me see here. Oh. It's a curse to have fat fingers. 
in this day and age. <laughs> the engineers in the world don't appreciate elderly fingers. Let's try this. No, let's not try it. It didn't work. Sorry. Didn't work. All right. Could have. Too bad. Uh, the calls are distinctive. They're they don't sound like uh, they don't really sound like a bird when you hear them. If you're standing at dawn, somewhere where you can hear down into a canyon, you might hear this kind of an eerie little call. I can't impersonate. Ron Levesque can do a really good impersonation. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, their numbers vary a lot from year to year. Some years we get a lot of them, and some years we get very few. And they uh, they have a strange migration pattern. They uh, kind of do an, an oval or a loop migration. So they will, uh, I believe they head south along the Sierras, and then they come north up along the coast. Uh, but that's a general rule, and the individuals don't observe that pattern always. But we get a lot of them sometimes in February. All right, let's move on. Woodpeckers. This is another one that uh, I did a, a tutorial video for. So we'll go fairly quickly, I think, through this because uh, I spend some time on it in the tutorial. Basically, how to tell downy and hairy woodpeckers apart. These are the two small woodpeckers that we have here on the coast. They're year-round residents. They have that white patch in the center of the back and that black and white striped face. The downy has the tiny little delicate bill and the hairy woodpecker has a big heavy woodpecker-like bill. Another way to tell them apart when, you, when they have their heads turned, I mean, you look at these two birds and it's hard to tell what you got because the angle is such that you can't see their bill size or shape very clearly. But look at the under tail pattern. This is something Roger Adamson turned me on to a couple of years ago. So the downy woodpeckers have those barred or spotted tail feathers underneath them, and uh, they, they poke out to the side when they're up against a tree, so you can actually see them. So look at that bird in the middle, and you look down there at the base of the tail, and you can see those barred feathers poking out, and then look at the bird on the far left, and he's pure white underneath. So the one on the left is a hairy, and the one in the middle is a downy, and that one on the far right is a downy as well. There's a big size difference, but it's not always evident when you only have one bird to look at. You can't compare them side to side. And then this is a great yard bird. Uh, this guy will be found, if you've got an apple tree in your yard, you probably have one of these guys poking holes in it. This is the red-breasted sapsucker. This is a male, or no, no, the males and females both have those bright red heads. And uh, they're not as common, they're not as abundant in numbers as the hairy and downy woodpeckers. So you got to kind of look around for them. Again, I'm going to go th fairly quickly through this because we've got much more time to spend on the, uh, in the tutorial on our YouTube channel. This guy is abundant in the winter. This is the northern flicker. And uh, I talk in the video a little bit about the, why he's got dirt on his bill. I'll just point out that we have northern red shafted flickers here, and that means that that malar stripe behind the bill is sort of strawberry pinkish red, and on a yellow shafted flicker, it's black. But uh, the undertail and wing linings are salmon pink to orange. Striking birds, big, big woodpeckers, and they're often seen on the ground. They mostly eat ants. And then this is the really big woodpecker. There's only a few of these on the coast. You generally hear these before you see them. They have a really loud call. They sound like they're going crazy. And uh, this is the pileated woodpecker. You'll know there's one around when you see holes drilled into dead rotting trees. And the holes are four to six inches long and two inches wide. Those are the signs of a pileated woodpecker. Hear their call, like, 
you got to look around and you'll see them fly by sometimes. Well, again, we have a whole video presentation on the differences between these two birds. So we'll just go through this pretty quickly. These are the two raptor and two um, exhibitors that we have on the Mendocino coast in wintertime. Uh, this is Cooper's hawk on the left and a sharp shinned hawk on the right. And the Coopers are uh, larger, they have a rounded tail, and their wings go straight out and form a cross. That's the mnemonic David taught me. Coopers make a cross, and that makes their head stick out in front of their wings pretty prominently. And then you look at the bird on the right, and he has a squared off tail, and that uh, crook in their wings right at the wrists. So Catherine says, Sharpies are wristy. And that actually is a pretty good way to tell them apart. You see that a lot when they're soaring in flight like this. And here they are side by side as immature birds with the streaked chest and the streaking is different. So the sharp shinned hawk on the left has coarse blurry streaks. As David says, they look like they've been drawn on with an old worn out Sharpie, hence the name. They also have little thin legs. That's actually where they get their name. They have, they have sharp shins. And then the Cooper's hawk on the right has those fine little streaks on its chest. And look down there at the tail. Its tail is rounded because the outer feathers are shorter than the central, central feathers. This, Jim, right? Jim, excuse me for jumping in. One, yeah, last, one last note about the Sharpies. If you, if you happen to have a lot of pine siskins in your yard, if you're feeding and you have a lot of pine siskins, you will, you will get Sharpies. Uh, I've seen more Sharpies in the last 10 days coming in for pine siskins mm -hmm. than uh, I'll usually see all winter, so. Yeah, these are both fairly common yard birds actually, uh, because if you're feeding birds in your yard, you're gonna be drawing these guys in after them. And, and if you're if you're feeding birds in, in your yard and they're all of a sudden they're gone, you either have a cat or a Sharpie or a Cooper's hanging around. So look up in the trees to see. And these are the birds I mentioned earlier. Uh, these are the reason why the little songbirds form guilds is for protection from these guys. The, they need to have a lot of eyeballs so that somebody's always looking around when a Sharp or a Cooper's comes by. Uh, and even, even that doesn't protect them. These guys still manage to make a living. All right, these are the big ones, the Budios with the big, long, heavy wings and heavy body. And this one is the most abundant Budio in North America and the most abundant one in Mendocino as well. Uh, even though it doesn't have a red tail, this is a red-tailed hawk. And the First thing to notice, the, the red-tailed hawks come in so many different plumages, but they all have one thing in common, and that is the black bar on the leading edge of the wing. Those are called patagial feathers, and the black bar uh, is basically the only thing that all red tails have. The, uh, the immature birds do not have red tails. Uh, some birds, like this one, have a belly band, some don't. The other thing that's common to most, but not all red tails, is the combination of dark head and pale chest. So those things, those are the best clues to look for. The dark band, if you see that, you're 100% sure you've got a red tail. If you see a dark head contrasting with a pale chest, you probably have a red tail. And if you've got those things plus the belly band, you definitely have a red tail. And if you see a good size hawk, I, I tell people, the first question you ask is, why is it not a red tail? Because yeah, it probably the, is. The, uh, there's a list going around on the internet of the rules of birding. And there's a subset to that. And it's the rules of raptor birding. And there's only one. And rule one is it's a red tail. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, that's right about 90% of the time, actually. There's you'll, so much more pass. abundant than all the others. You get a good grade with that answer. Exactly, yeah. You, you can never go wrong saying, I think it's a red tail. <laughs> uh, these are both red tails. Uh, just to give you an idea, of some this isn't even the whole range of variability, uh, but you can just have two birds side by side that look like they should be different species, but they're both red tails. Again, dark head, pale chest. 
this is not a red tail, uh, but this is the other common year round resident butio here on the Mendocino coast. And this is the red shouldered hawk. It's an immature bird on the left and an adult on the right. The adults have that gorgeous cinnamon chest and they both have that black and white checkerboard pattern on their back and wings. Really striking birds. They're small butios, much smaller than a red tail. And you see them a lot here, uh, perched on wires and fence posts and street lamps. And they're uh, just like red tails, they like to perch and hunt. And they take a lot of small, very small prey, like insects and earthworms and things like that. Here's a great size comparison photo. This is an adult red shouldered hawk. And you see that cinnamon chest and it spreads out into the wing linings as well. And when they're freshly molted, it's, it can be almost bright orange. And again, you see the checkerboard wings and you can see some comma shaped uh, panels in the outer wings and that banded tail with a narrow tail band contrasting with the darker tail. Uh, will any other juvenile hawk have a spotted back like a red shoulder? Yes, actually, not like a red shoulder. Um, red shoulders have a, that really striking checkerboard pattern and no other hawk will show that. But there are other juvenile hawks that show spots on the back. And in fact, we talk about that in the, the video tutorial about sharp shin and Cooper's hawks because uh, immature Coopers often have big white patches on their backs. And so do red tails. But it looks very different from the, that black and white checkerboard of a red shoulder. Okay, here's a doozy. And this is one, we might get one or two of these in the Fort Bragg count, but David, you're going to get these guys down in Manchester. Uh, this is the largest North American butio. It's almost up into eagle territory in terms of size, and it has a great big beak too. This is the ferruginous hawk. Uh, this one is an immature ferruginous. It doesn't have the red shoulders yet. And the thing to notice on ferruginous hawks is that underneath they are entirely pale. They have just a few little markings on them, but they have a pale throat, pale chest, pale belly, pale all the way to the tip of the tail, and they have a pale head. So when you ask the question, why is this not a red tail? It's because it's got a pale head. That's why. Uh, the other thing to notice before we go off this shot is that yellow gape. They have a big heavy bill and a bright yellow gape even when they're adults. The gape is that lining around the bill. Here's what an adult looks like in flight, and there's the ferruginous color, the rusty red shoulders. Again, pale head, pale throat, pale chest, and the tail uh, is white at the base and then shades out kind of to dirty gray at the tip. In, in bright light, it looks like they have a white tail, uh, and sometimes you can get all excited and think you're seeing a bald eagle, but they are considerably different. Bald eagles have a dark body, and ferruginous hawks. Uh, except for the dark morphs, they look real pale like this bird. Great birds, one of my favorite raptors. And this is another favorite. This is the Northern Harrier, and immediately recognizable by that white rump patch that they flash while flying. They're also instantly recognizable just by their flight habit. They're, they fly almost like a big butterfly, uh, sort of languid, buoyant flight up and down flap and glide, real low over the ground. And then look at that face. They have an owl-like face. And when they're flying, they're both looking and listening for prey. And when they hear something rustling in the grass, they just instantly wheel and dive. It looks like they've been shot out of the sky and uh, they'll try to grab it. They have a very low success rate and they make up for it with persistence. These are a bird of the open country. So is this. This is a bird of fields. This is the white-tailed kite caught in the act of kiting or hovering. Uh, they flutter their wings and hold their heads absolutely still while they stare intently at the ground looking for meadow voles, which is almost all they eat. And there's a handful of these on the coast. They're a bird that is in decline 
in California generally, and there's quite a bit of concern about white-tailed kite populations. They're hanging on here on the coast, but their habitat is uh, definitely threatened because they really require open areas, open fields that are, they would love it when there's a little bit of brush and a lot of grass that doesn't get mowed because that fosters a large population of meadow moles, meadow voles, or meadow mice as people call them. And that's almost all they eat. In the tutorial on falcons, there's a great sequence of shots that Roger has of one of these guys plunging into the grass and coming up with a vole. And here's uh, the two small falcons. <laughs> yeah, David's shaking his head because you never see this. <laughs> this is just an unbelievable photograph that Ron got many years ago. Uh, that's an American kestrel in the upper left and a merlin down there on the lower right, uh, bizarrely occupying the same tree. These are two birds that do not get along with each other or for that matter with any other birds. The, the merlins are no, very notorious. Uh, aggressive, they chase practically everything, and so do kestrels within their territory. They're extremely territorial birds, and they will frequently be seen dive bombing red tails and pretty much everything else. Uh, the kestrel is a uh, pretty abundant, uh, especially down on the Manchester count. They got a lot of kestrels down there, but we have a few here too, and. They're another bird that in North America generally is in real trouble. Their numbers are declining. Uh, I would say they're plummeting. And there is a lot of concern about kestrels. But the coastal population is holding on pretty well. There are a very small number that might breed here. I, I know a few years ago we found a nest. Merlins, on the other hand, are exclusively wintertime visitors to the coast. And they look dark like that, like this one. Uh, dark streaked chest and a dark head, and the kestrels have that pretty little face pattern to them. Finally, in the open country, uh, this is a common sight when you're walking through the grass. This is the western meadowlark, recognizable in flight by those bright white outer tail feathers. And then, of course, when they're standing still, either you don't see them at all if they have their backs to you, or you see their bright yellow chest. David, you want to take over for a minute? Let me get a drink of water. Absolutely. Boy, this is this is one of my favorite birds again. Uh, this is the Says Phoebe. This is uh, this bird is larger than the black Phoebe. This is also a, uh, a winter bird here. Um, I believe that they're more common now than they were 10, 15 years ago, 20 years ago. These uh, were relatively hard to find. As I walk around Fort Bragg now, um, oftentimes I'll see one uh, behind the fire station at the edge of the mill site, um, up at uh, at the uh, 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 playground, the, the east side of the field at the middle school. Uh, you go down south of the Navarro and they become quite, uh, quite uh, common. Mm -hmm. It's a beautiful bird. It's um, it tends to move around more. The, the black Phoebe, its first cousin, tends to uh, have more fidelity to a hunting perch. This bird will tend to move around more as it hunts, um, and it likes the open fields. I, I say that, and we've got a picture of it here in some kind of a bush, but uh, <laughs> this, is, this is a great bird. Uh, Says Phoebe, S-A-Y-S. Yeah, they really are pretty with that salmon, salmon pink underbelly. A uh, very striking, handsome bird. Here's another handsome bird. <laughs> this is in my yard at a water fountain. A pair of western bluebirds, the female on the left and the male on the right. And pretty hard to mistake them for anything else, especially the males. They are uh, doing pretty well this year. I got a, quite a few of them in my yard and mm -hmm. they're scattered around and you hear them. They have a distinctive call. They go, beer, 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 beer. It's a little liquid note. They're, they're chubby. They're rounder than a lot of the other, rel this is a relatively small bird. You can kind of get that sense from this photo. But they're, uh, 
maybe that's why I like them so much. I, <laughs> I can relate. Well, that's, that's a good observation because um, you can actually identify them by silhouette. Yes. Fortunate because that's often how you see them. They perch on wires a lot. And uh, on our gray, cloudy winter days with the light diffused behind them, you can't see the color at all frequently. And all you've got is a silhouette to go by. But that round chest and belly uh, really sets them apart from the other birds on the wire. And again, I don't know if we said this, but they're first cousins to the American robin. Uh, they're the smallest of our thrushes, but they are a thrush. They're, cousin to the robin. And you can see that in the, the red on the breast. That's right. I, we did not mention that, but they are not flycatchers, even though that's what they do for a living. Yeah, they're thrushes. And uh, where do these guys land? They, they look like a thrush with a thrush-like bill, but I don't think they are. They're in their own little group. Uh, this is a bird we see here primarily right down next to the beach, sometimes on the beach and uh, right behind the beach in the, this one, where this one is in the grass right behind the beach. This is the American pipit, distinguished by the streaked or spotted chest and that little bit of a face pattern and the thrush bill. And uh, they also have a di fairly distinctive call that you can hear when they fly, that just alerts you to look up when they go by. They're a fairly cryptic bird and easy to overlook. If you go to the refuges in the Central Valley, the Sac Refuge, the Calusa, Gray Lodge, you see a lot of them uh, as you go around the auto tour. They'll be on the sides of the road. The thing you'll notice about them, you notice about them here too, is they'll bob their tail. They're, uh, they are a group called Wagtail. Uh, so and they live up to their name. Yeah, that's, yep. Yeah, that is a great mark, too, because they do. They walk along, they go bob, bob, bobbing along. Oh, here we go, three of my favorite little guys. So we put all three of the wrens into one slide just so we could talk about the differences. Uh, but that's a little bit misleading because you will never see them like this. They all three live in completely different habitats. So that actually helps us identify them because if you find a wren, just look at where it is and you'll probably be able to identify it. The one on the left is always found in wet, cold, nasty, dark places. Uh, they would love it like in upper uh, Russian Gulch and uh, at Van Dam up in the canyon in those ferns. That's the Pacific Wren with the prodigiously loud voice. And uh, they're an all dark wren. They have almost no real field marks on them, except that they're just like a little dark chocolate bird with that perky up tail. And you hear them a lot in the underbrush before you see them. They do a double chip. Chip, 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 chip. So you listen for that and then wait them out until they pop up where you can see them. But frequently you never will see them. You have to count these birds by ear a lot of time. That's not true for the bird on the right. Uh, well, no, it is. And it's not true for the one in the middle. Uh, the one in the middle is a very hard bird to find on the Fort Bragg count, but I think you probably get them pretty regularly down in Manchester. Yes, we do. They are definitely more abundant south of the Navarro River. I have one in my yard. I live in Albion, and I have one here this year, but in most years, just an occasional visitor. Uh, and then south of the Navarro, they're much more abundant. That's the Buick's wren, and it's uh, identifiable by that prominent white supercilium, an eyebrow stripe, and the long tail. They have a nasty little call they make, this sort of electric buzz. They sound really angry when they do it. Uh, they're a bird of open country. You find them in brushy meadows, primarily. Uh, they skulk about in the brush. Down at Elk, there's that area behind Queenie's with the old, uh, where the homes, there used to be a bunch of homes out there, and they had rose bushes in their yards, and now they have great big uh, bramble patches of wild rose, and in good years, there's a pair of Buick's wrens in every one of them. The bird on the right is a bird of the marshes. You can see it's 
perched on a reed, and that's because it's the marsh wren. Although we have a weird population out on the mill site, right up against the bluffs, that lives in weeds. Uh, it's not a marsh, and so it's the weed wren. But marsh wrens are talkers. They chatter a lot, and they have this metallic calls and song, which they are extremely proud of and repeat often. So when you're in a marshy territory and you hear that metallic chatter coming out of the reeds, you've got a marsh wren. Three different birds that are similar in appearance, but totally different habitats. And again, habitat, these, uh, these guys are found in the same habitat. This is the two egrets that we commonly have, the common or great egret on the left and the snowy egret on the right, easily distinguished by size and bill color. The common egret has that bright yellow, very large bill, and snowy egrets have a thinner and all black bill. Snowy egrets also have those golden slippers. They have yellow, bright yellow feet. You still get any uh, cattle egrets down down your way, David, down in the Manchester? Not every year. Uh, they still show up, but they're very, very unreliable now. Used to be back in the day, they were common, not now. Yeah, I don't have a slide for a cattle egret because they're so rare here anyway. They have a sh bird. short neck and a different bill. There you go. All right. Yeah. I was once asked, if you were a duck, what duck would you want to be? And without a, without a hesitation, I said a common merganser. Mm -hmm. I think that male on the right is one of the most beautiful ducks. Um, this is a year round resident. That, and, uh, there's two females tagging along behind him. Let me just set the stage with the habitat. This is a duck of the freshwater streams. They'll get all the way down to the mouth of the uh, uh, of the Ten Mile or the mouth of the Navarro, but they you'll more likely find them a little bit further up. I've never seen a common merganser out on the ocean. They they're predominantly freshwater birds. Uh, the male has that very distinct patterning of the dark head, the reddish bill, that, those big white flanks. Look at the female. Now, we're going to, I think we're going to see a slide here in a minute of a uh, red breasted merganser. The red breasted mergansers are here in the winter and they're almost always out on the ocean, but the females of these two species look very much alike. Notice here on, uh, see that male uh, common merganser? Look at the, the head neck break. It's like you took a head and you stuck it on a neck. Uh, ditto with the females. There's a real clean break between the brown of the head and the white of the neck. That is not a small thing. That is a, that is a hard key that you wanna try to learn. To, uh, to help you identify these two mergansers. Okay, Tim? Okay. Uh, yeah, the, the, where you see them is a real great clue. The, you can, I have sometimes seen both common and red-breasted in the Navarro River, but never in the same part of the river. The common mergansers are typically seen up by the bridge and the red-breasted are all the way down by the sandbar. And these common mergansers on the Navarro, they will oftentimes uh, in the summer, as you go around uh, the first couple bends, they'll, uh, you'll see them on the far side of the river on a uh, mud bank that, that goes out. And they'll be the female and a whole bunch of little common mergansers. Yep. Uh, keep an eye out in the summer. Uh, stay in your lane, but look for the mergansers. <laughs> now these are hoodies. These are hooded mergansers. What's a merganser? A merganser is a duck, duh. Okay, but look at the bill. Look at the bill. It's not a duck bill per se. It doesn't look like a mallard or a shoveler or even a pintail. It's a long and narrow bill because they are uh, primarily uh, fish eaters. 
Now these guys, all, they love to catch crawdads too, but that bill is really designed for grabbing on to a living organism, a large mobile living organism underwater and, and securing it firmly. So uh, the heads are not always displayed upwards like that. They can be pulled back down and much flatter. But the male will always have uh, uh, some white in the head the female oftentimes has this, uh, it reminds me of the actress in uh, Bride of Frankenstein, you know, with that <laughs> big hair, yep. big hair. Uh, they're great birds. They tend to be found on ponds, the yeah. Casper Pond, the pond in Casper just east of the highway. We oftentimes find males and or females on that pond. Okay. Yeah, just uh, about the bills, the uh, the British call all the mergansers uh, collectively uh, saw bills. Because mm. Bills are toothed. They, yes. They're, they're like saws. And again, that's for holding on to fish. Now, these are the wood ducks. And these are, um, they, they should have been called the scaredy ducks because they are, they are very, very shy. Um, we used to be able to see them fairly regularly on uh, Laguna Pond, uh, but McCarricker, uh, but only at the very, very far southeastern end where nobody could come close to them. The male is easy peasy, easy to identify. The female, what you want to look for is that big teardrop whiteness or, uh, around the eye ring, that big teardrop white eye ring that, that tails back uh, towards the back of the head. Um, but again, um, if you think you know where some are, approach them very quietly because they will, they will fly away. And in flight, this is gonna sound weird, okay? I, I, it sounded weird to me when I first heard it, but it's true. In flight, this is the duck that has a tail. <laughs> okay, when when they fly away from you, you, you will notice that there's a tail on this duck. Most other ducks, there's just kind of something at the end of their body. They have these uh, bowling pin bodies, uh, but these guys actually fly with a tail. Okay. They're a great bird when you can find them, but they're pretty scarce around here. They are. These aren't. So we just, I believe we just moved into the grebes. And yep. this, this is arguably the most common grebe year round that you're likely to encounter close up. There's a lot of qualifiers in that statement, but it's true. This is, <laughs> this is the pied bill grebe. This is the pied bill grebe in winter. It may even be a young bird. Um, they occur in uh, primarily on freshwater ponds. Uh, they're diving birds, and they have this uh, wonderful ability to just submarine without diving like most birds do. They leap forward and go under. This bird can actually slowly sink down into the water sometimes with just its, its eyes above the water, its eyes and bill sticking out. Other times they'll go completely down. They're small. This is our smallest green. Uh, it, you can see in this photo, they're round. They're kind of a puffy cotton uh, at, the, at the rear end. And the reason I said this is probably a young bird or at least a bird in winter is because the adults, particularly as we get closer to spring, will develop a very pronounced uh, black bar, a uh, black vertical bar at, towards, the, uh, towards the end of the bill, which gives them the name pied bill, black and white bill. And they'll also get a very sharp white ring around the eye. But this is the common pied bill green freshwater resident year round, okay? Tim, I'm going to let you handle this slide. I love these birds. I'm going to let you talk about them. <laughs> okay, so we went from uh, ponds 
and now we're getting into wet meadows and marsh habitat birds. Um, this, this is a great slide that Roger sent me just a few days ago. I think this is actually in town on one of the football fields. Um, these are Wilson snipe. And uh, the, the joke here is how many of them can you count in this photograph? And the, the answer I'd like to give you is maybe 40. <laughs> There's actually four that you can see, but with snipe, the, if you can see four, there must be 40 somewhere because these are really cryptically colored birds and you never usually see all of them. Uh, you won't know how many there are until you walk out and flush them and then they fly off and make their distinctive little noise. But these are uh, kind of uncommon birds here on the coast and they're tricky to find because they're cryptically colored and they have a habit of holding very, very still when there's something around that might be a threat. Uh, and so if you, if you don't see them before they do that, they're really hard to see until they fly. If you get close to them and they fly off, they have a distinctive flight habit. They zigzag, they fly very, very fast, and they usually will let out an alarm call when they fly, this weird little noise they make. Wilson's snipe. Well, this is unfortunate that the uh, sounds aren't working because that's about the only way to get this bird. This is a Sora, uh, which is very, very hard to see. They rarely come out of the cover. They're found only in freshwater marshes. And the way you find them is you walk up to a marsh and clap your hands real loud and it will startle them and they will, they will call. Unfortunately, the calls are not working tonight. So uh, if you have one of the apps on your phone, you can play a call or you can go to xenocanto.org and uh, you can find calls for everything there. But these guys make a little yelping call. When you, if you clap and startle them, you'll hear this little geek. And that's, uh, that's either a Sora or a Virginia rail. And both of them are hidden back into the reeds. We don't have a lot of marsh habitat for these guys in our account, although uh, we have more now than we did before they opened up the mill site. You know, we can get up to that mill pond and there's, a, there's usually one of, those, one of these birds in that pond. And I think you get them down uh, in Irish Beach at the pond there, don't you? Yeah, we, we typically do, Tim, yeah. Yeah, they, they like kind of quiet, secluded areas with a lot of, uh, a lot of reeds. They're, they're skulkers. And in a real wet, in a real wet year down, um, uh, uh oh, your internet just from, um, Minor Hole Road, and in real wet winters, um, they're in those reeds on the east side of Highway One, just before you climb up towards uh, uh, the Lighthouse Point. But it has to be wet. Okay, uh, cormorants. Now there's a uh, there's going to be another tutorial on our Facebook uh, uh, YouTube page uh, where we're gonna go into greater detail about the three different cormorants. But they're all three common cormorants on the coast are here in this one slide. So very briefly, the one in the start with the upper right, that uh, upper left, excuse me, the other right, the left, uh, that is the pelagic cormorant, the one that's uh, with its back to us and his face pointed to the right. Why is it a pelagic cormorant? They all look black, they all have long necks and they all have long bills. That's a pelagic cormorant in this photo because of the thinness, the, 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 the width of the bill is quite thin. And they're not really anhinga-like, but of the three, this is the one cormorant that doesn't really have much of a head. The neck just kind of ends in this long, narrow bill. This is, that's the hard way to tell this bird. The easy way to tell this bird is that about this time of year, they start to get big white patches uh, right near the, the base of the tail on the flanks. Black and white is the birder's delight. You can see black and white 
quite easily at a great distance and help you identify them as soon as they get into this breeding, they start getting into breeding plumage around Christmas. So look for the black and white. Now the one over to the right with his wings spread out, that's an easy bird to tell as well. It's actually easier. That is the double crested cormorant. And what makes it easy to identify is all that orange in the lower throat in what we call the Guler area, the Guler pouch. That bird is unique in this slide, uh, not because of the orange so much, but due to the fact that it primarily, it's hard to say anything always about birds because they'll, they'll break the rules just because they can. It's that independence that comes with flight. This bird primarily nests uh, on fresh water and it usually nests inland on lakes or, or streams. It does, however, there is a small uh, colony that uh, nests up Big River about a mile or two uh, in the redwoods. So that's the double crested cormorant. Uh, it's primarily a winter bird. There are a few here in the summer uh, and it's got that big orange Bueller pouch. Now what's going on at the bottom? This is a tougher bird. Um, to identify from this slide, but you know, this is real life. You don't, you don't get in real life, you very seldom get that uh, field guide photo quality uh, viewing of a bird. You usually have to infer from little things that you see who they are. And what we infer from this is that these are brant cormorants. Now, why do I think they're brant cormorants? Uh, I'm looking at the bird in the center, and that bird in the center has a much thicker bill, particularly uh, at the base, than does the pelagic cormorant in the upper left. Also, I can see on that, uh, that brant cormorant in the center, there's right in the gular area, right in the throat, there's a hint of whiteness there. In the breeding season, these birds get incredibly bright golden blue. I call them the cow bear birds because they, they show that golden blue like my, alumna, my, like my old alma mater cow. In the winter, there's still a trace of that. It's, it's, it's quiet, but it's still there. And so the heavy bill, the little bit of pale gold in the throat, tells me that that bird in the center is a branch cormorant. And again, we'll go into much greater detail in the tutorial on our, our Facebook page, but that's the, that's the quote unquote quick rundown, which wasn't really so quick on our three, <laughs> our three cormorants. Just to make it longer, I'll just point out one other way that I, uh, the, the, a clue, it's not really a hard and fast rule, but just a clue is the brants cormorants tend to hang out on the tops of the rocks. Both the brants and the pelagics are marine cormorants. So you find them mostly out there at the edge of the sea. And the brants will be on the top of the rock and the pelagic cormorants will be perched on the side of the rock. Not always, but it's helpful. When they're not perched on logs. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 there's, Pelagics are supposed to be a marine cormorant, but there's some that go up Noyo River, like that one. Yeah, a big river as well. Now here we have uh, the the two of them in flight. Uh, this is a, kind of funny. We always talk about uh, the double crests flying with a crook in the neck. Well, the brants do too. The bird on the top is the brant cormorant. It has the you can see the blue underneath and the bill and that kind of a uh, hint of what will become bright gold in the summer, also right in the throat. And notice there's a, 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 a pretty good size head and a thick bill on that bird compared to the one below it. There's that white patch I was talking about. There's that white rump patch that tells you, that's like the barcode that says <laughs> pelagic cormorant. Um, long, narrow head, narrow bill, 
Uh, and this is a, a photo that was taken uh, uh, not in the dead of winter because you're starting to see a little bit of red in the face of that pelagic cormorant um, down on the bottom. We spend hours and hours and hundreds of hours out in the field and these two birds become um, fairly easy to identify. But when you're first starting out, ain't that way, they're tough. Okay, next slide. These are double crested cormorants. We just saw that little bit of a crick uh, in the neck of the brant cormorant but these are major bends. It almost looks like they flew into a wall and they broke their necks and they're kind of crooked now. Um, these are double crested cormorants. Um, there's another feature to the double crested cormorant that you will not yet, I think someday you will find in the field guides. That is that our two marine cormorants, the, the, the pelagic and the brants always fly at a very low altitude. They don't skim the, they don't have to skim the waves like a pelican does, but they're, they very seldom get very far above the, uh, the headlands, the head tops of the headlands. Double crested cormorants, the ones that nest inland, will fly with the geese. They'll be way up in the sky and they're the only cormorant that we have that flies way up in the sky. And, and very quickly, a, a, a brief gotcha story. I was headed home in Fort Bragg. I was up around uh, the tire store there by where the old Safeway used to be. And I saw a V flight heading south. I flipped a U-turn real quick and I sped through all, you know, I stopped at the stoplights, but I kept moving south to try to catch up with that V of birds because it was the wrong time of year for a V of birds. And I knew they were geese. And I finally got down to jug handle and I got just a little bit above them and I threw out my binoculars and they were double crested cormorants. And what I learned from that lesson was that uh, when you see a V up in the sky uh, and you and you're, you're a little unsure, you can tell if it's double crested by the rapidity of the wing beat. They beat their wings much faster than the larger wings of the geese. The geese flap their wings much more purposefully. These guys flap very rapidly, but they will look like geese uh, to, the, to uh, a fool who does U-turns in the middle of Fort Bragg. So, uh, okay, that's it. We'll move on. These um, are low-flying bay ducks. These are scoters. Uh, how do I know? Um, look at 95% uh, uh, of them, 90% uh, of them have uh, light bills and a white patch on the back of the head. That's classic. And, and the ones that are closer, you can see there's even a white patch up on top of the head. And they're, they're all black other than that. That's classic male surf scoters. But what's that bird in the middle? And the second one from the right, those, those don't fit that description. I, I've, I see some white in the head of the middle bird, but it's in the eye, not on the back of the head. And I don't see a light bill. That's a white winged scoter. And where we live, uh, uh, th these birds are most common in the winter. They're very, very common in the winter. And they do, the surf scoters do like to live in the surf. If you go uh, just north of Ward Avenue, they'll be in the surf. Um, my rule of thumb for scoters, scoters are large, heavy bay ducks. They're diving ducks. They're, they're the good sized ducks um, and they dive. You'll see a hundred surf scoters. You'll see three or four white wing scoters and you'll see one black scoter and that's pretty much the way it is here. S most of our scoters are surf scoters. There's a, a handful of these white wings 
and then very rarely you're blessed with the sight of a black wing scoter that can be told by the big orange uh, knob on the, uh, at the base of the bill. Do you have anything to add, uh, Tim? Uh, not really, just that uh, I think you're optimistic. I, I, I count myself lucky when I can find a white wing sneaking along in a flock of surf scoters like this uh, during November and December when there are hundreds and sometimes thousands of surf scoters flying by. I can just camp out there with a scope and just wait for a long time before one of those white wings will show up. They got pretty scarce. Uh, they they breed in San Francisco Bay, if I'm not mistaken. And I think a lot of them got killed in a oil spill many years ago and their population is slowly recovering. Somebody asked if they're found together, the, the surf scoters and the white wings, and they are. This is uh, generally how you see them here on the coast. Mm -hmm. There's a flock of surf scoters flying by and one, maybe two white wings kind of sneaking in with them. Drop dead gorgeous. Yeah. You know, people people like the wood duck. Eh, it's okay. A little gaudy, a little a little frou frou. <laughs> kind these of overdone. Harlequins, these harlequins, quintessentially a beautiful duck. Uh, the male on the right, um, gorgeous bird. Female, eh, she's all right. But uh, that that male is a classic, classic look. Um, they're primarily again they you can't say always or never when you're talking about birds no matter what the topic is but they're primarily a winter visitor here on the coast um used to be a great place to see them was uh near the uh, what's now the mill trail uh as you uh go on the north side uh now they have a bench where the where the second uh glass beach access stairway where the stairway used to be where they took it out there's a small island there that um, at high tide anytime other than low tide you'd find harlequin ducks uh, perched on that uh, on the inside of that island resting um, with all the traffic that there is now on that mill trail uh, they seem to have moved on the other place I would look for a harlequin duck would be to go to Virgin Beach, uh, Virgin Creek at a lower tide and walk north along the shore uh, a couple, 100, 200 yards. And there are some wash rocks that are exposed at the lower tides. And that's another uh, fairly reliable roosting, uh, resting place for them in the winter. That's a harlequin duck. Yeah, there is. A sea duck that lives, it's amazing to see them bobbing around in the rough water right next to these rocks. And the waves are just smashing into the rocks and these birds just bob around right in the middle of it. Little corks. Yeah. Uh, I was up in uh, Denali, way out at the far end of Denali uh, many years ago and uh, found these guys breeding uh, alongside the rivers up in Alaska. Yeah, they're a torrent duck. They used to be regular in winter here, but they're getting, in recent years, we have uh, struggled to find them. I don't think we had them on the last two Christmas camps. Small footnote, uh, Jeff and Kate with uh, Liquid Fusion up in uh, Dolphin Isle Marina had probably an older duck they called Squeaky that would spend the entire year on the banks of the Noyo River. Um, evidently, he just didn't have the hormones running to uh, induce a migration, and he was just hanging out. He's gone now. Squeaky's yeah. gone to the great, uh, the great surf zone in the sky. <laughs> now, we were talking about common mergansers. These are the red-breasted mergansers that I promised. Um, the male it has that dark head, but he has that hair thing going as well. And he has a, a black head and a white uh, band around the neck, and then kind of a brown brown uh, breast and gray on the flanks. You can see what I'm describing. It's right in front of us, so I don't need to go through it. The thing that's important about the female is notice how the head, the brown of the head, blends into the gray on the neck. 
there's not a sharp demarcation line like we had with the female common merganser. The other thing is uh, these are 99% of the time out on the ocean. Uh, they can come into the uh, into the uh, river mouths, but they really uh, they really like it out in the marine environment. And again, they have they have these prodigious fish uh, catching bills, serrated edges, uh, great diving ducks, red breasted merganser. You'll see it here only in the winter. Okay. Grebes. What makes a grebe? Well, the short answer is uh, a diving bird with lobed toes. They have lobed toes, not webbed feet. And uh, two, we saw the pied bill grebe earlier, which is our smallest grebe. These are two grebes, not large grebes. These are the next size up. These uh, are easily confused. And uh, we're going to do a tutorial on these birds as well. So I'll try to keep this brief. Uh, see, we're starting to lose a few people and it's getting late. The bird on the right is um, a horned grebe. Now, we only get these in the winter, unfortunately, because when they go into breeding plumage, they look very different. And you can easily tell them apart. But in the winter, uh, you can confuse them. The right bird, a horned grebe. Uh, the there's a relatively sharp demarcation of, be, on the head between the black crown and the white cheek. They both have these red eyes. They both have medium length necks. The horned grebe on the right also has a little more light in the uh, neck. The front of the neck is a little bit lighter. Um, the bird on the left is an eared grebe. We can see here that the, the blackness on the head comes down well below the eye and kind of almost blends into the neck. Uh, people refer to this bird as having a dirty neck. Um, and I guess it kind of is. It's darker for sure. And uh, the whiteness in the face tends to be less uh, demarcated, it's less separated, it tends to blend in, um, not unlike that uh, blending we just saw with the female, um, with the female uh, uh, red-breasted merganser. I call these uh, informally the reared grebe, uh, and that's a, that's a little bit misleading, but you take a look at this bird on the left, this eared grebe, and it's got this big poofy butt. I mean, there's and um, that is really a soft. I'm getting that unstable sign again. My wife's watching something. My wife's watching Netflix in the other room. Um, these horned grebes over here can also have big puffy butts. So don't, don't use that as a strong key. Look at the black and white in the face. Anything to add, Tim? Uh, that's about it. Just that uh, it's, it's actually much harder than you made it sound because these guys are invariably seen out bobbing in the waves and you just get little glimpses of them between the waves. And then just as you get to where you've got your binoculars focused on them, they all simultaneously dive. You have to wait until they come up and then they come up where you weren't looking and uh, yeah, they're just the most frustrating birds to try to identify. They, they certainly are. The purpose yeah. of the Christmas bird count, uh, you, don't, you don't, don't feel like you have to choose a species. Uh, it can be grebe spa if you can't tell which one these are. They're both fairly common here. And that's why we have area leaders, because they, they, they'll know the difference. Again, real briefly, because uh, we have this on a tutorial, and I'm sorry I went on so long about those two, but uh, these are two very similar looking grebes, very difficult to tell apart at a great distance. Uh, the one on the top is the old western grebe. The one on the bottom is the uh, newly separated Clark's grebe. 
what I notice about uh, this, these two birds is the one on the top, the one on the bottom is actually easier to tell because the eye is not hidden in the black of the crown and the neck is so much whiter and there's more white on the flanks. Again, when I said birders delight in black and white, uh, this bird on the bottom is, uh, it, all that white is noticeable. Be careful because the western grebe can sometimes, like the loons, can roll over on its side and preen and that throws everything out of whack. But um, again, we'll give more detail in the tutorial, but the bird on the top, the western, has the uh, black goes down below the eye. The Clark on the bottom, the eye is in the white part of the face. Okay, we better keep moving. It's getting close yeah. to the witching hour here. Here on the coast, about uh, it's probably 10 to 1 westerns to Clarks. Absolutely. Really hard to find a Clarks out there on the water. This is our last uh, grebe, I promise. This is the red necked grebe. And um, unfortunately, we only get to see them in the winter. There's uh, the necks in the summer are really red. The best thing I can say about this bird is we see it out on the ocean. It is intermediate in size and the, the neck is intermediate in length between the two classes of two groups of grebes that we just looked at. It's smaller than the Western and Clark's. It's bigger than the horned and eared. Uh, these tend, not always, but they tend to be solitary where we are here. And uh, we see them in the bays. Um, I give you the redneck grebe in winter. And uh, somebody just asked a really good question on the chat. I was just about to point out that the bird I confuse these with isn't other grebes, it's loons. Uh, and they do look kind of loon-like because they have a big heavy bill that they hold. Uh, the one thing about telling them apart from loons is the way they hold their bill. As you can see in this photo, they kind of tip their bill down a little bit. And most of the loons hold their bills either horizontally or tipped up a little bit. So that's one way. They are much, much smaller than loons. Yes. But again, that's hard to tell out in the ocean. Uh, they have longer necks. Uh, basically, it's just the shape of the bird. A loon looks like it can barely float, and they have short necks and big heads and heavy bills. This guy has a longer neck. Yeah, I was going to say, these birds are much more buoyant. They're, they're, they ride yeah. higher in the water than the loons. Yeah. Here's how. Here's Speaking of which, huh? Yeah. Go ahead, <laughs> so this makes it easy when you can, if, if only they would do this in the field and just sit themselves right next to each other so you could sort them all out and make it easier. Uh, but this is the three species of winter loons that we have here. Um, all of them in the winter plumage. So the one on the top is the common loon. One thing that's misleading about the way I put this slide together, it makes them look like they're all the same size and they're not. The common loon is huge and the other two are smaller. So the common loon has that big heavy bill that it holds horizontally and it has this neck pattern uh, that makes it at a distance, it looks like it's blurry. You don't see a sharp division between the white front of its neck and the dark behind. The loon below it is the Pacific loon, and notice that it has a almost straight up and down dark line separating the white front of its throat from the gray back of its head. You can actually see that most of the time out on the water. Both of those birds have big heavy bills that they hold horizontally. And notice that they barely, uh, their backs are barely out of the water. They ride really low, all loons do. The one on the bottom is the smallest of the three. It's the red-throated loon. And the key thing to see about it is the small upturned bill. When they're swimming around, they hold their bills tipped up. And it's distinctly different from either of the other two. And their bill is much smaller and uh, thinner. It doesn't look as heavy. They show a lot of white in their faces in the wintertime. Uh, these birds, these birds oh. are challenging. 
because they, they're oftentimes far enough offshore that it's difficult to pick up uh, a lot of the features. Um, so you'll and they don't, make it, they don't make it easy uh, because they go underwater sometimes for two or three minutes at a time. Yeah. It can cover a tremendous distance when they go underwater. I, I swear yeah. I've seen one go 400 yards underwater. Oh, and they're fast underwater. Um, I will point out that one of the two things. Number one, Sibley's Guide, when Sibley's Guide came out, I noted that they had uh, weights as part of the identification of the birds. Uh, Sibley lists the red throated as about a little over three pounds, the Pacific is about 3.7 pounds, and he identifies the, the common loon as weighing it at nine pounds. We were talking about the difference between three and a half pound bird and a nine pound bird. That's how much larger the, the common loon is. Second point I want to make is that you can, these birds migrate up north to breed, and yet there's always a small population of young birds that stay here on the coast throughout the summer, particularly in Mendocino Bay uh, and on Big River sometimes. So one of the better ways, uh, more reliable ways to become familiar with these birds is to catch the young birds in the summertime when they're closer to shore, when they're not as active. Um, and you can begin to pick up on some of these features and get more familiar with them. Okay. Yeah, you get plenty of chances. They're, they're all three of them are regulars here in the wintertime. Oh no, we're in. Oh, listen, listen. Okay, we're down to 27, down from 39. We're down to oh, 26. <laughs> Somebody just bailed. Stop that. <laughs> I knew we'd lose people when we got the gulls. No, okay. Well, this is all being recorded. So if you're, if you fall asleep, you can, you can, you can watch it again. You know, you can watch the replay. Listen, I want to say a few words very briefly about the gulls uh, because there'll be a tutorial on our, uh, our YouTube channel. I've been birding now for 45 years and I'm getting, a, I'm starting to get a handle on the gulls after 45 years of birding. <laughs> um, and it can be done. And the way to do it is to, it's the same way we do it with sparrows. Pick a bird that you get to know use it as the guide and then compare everything else to that bird. So uh, our anchor bird for the gulls is the, the one bird that we have here year round, which is the western gull, the bird on the left. And fortunately for us, the western gull is the only gull that we have in the, because in the winter we get, we get inundated by other types of gulls. But the western gull is the only adult gull with a white head in the winter. So you can always pick out the western gulls and then you can compare them. Use the flock to your advantage and compare the, this gull to that gull. And one of the gulls we get is this gull on the right, which is the glaucous winged gull. This, we're looking at adults here now. We're not going to talk about young birds. Uh, we're going to just start easy with adults. Notice the wings. Notice the primaries out at the end. There are no black feathers in these wings. This is the glaucous winged gull, and it's the, our only gull that doesn't have black wingtips. It's an easy peasy gull to identify. And also, this is a gull in winter because it's here. And notice the head. There's grayness in the head of the bird on the right because all, everybody besides the Western, except the Western, everybody gets gray on their heads in the winter. Let's move on to the next slide, Tim. We don't wanna stay on these too long. So here are two other gulls. And again, use the flock, embrace the flock, compare the birds. What do we see? We see a bird on the left that is substantially bigger than the bird on the right. The bird on the left, has uh, black on the tip and red on the tip. It has gray down uh, along the nape of the neck. Bird on the right has a round head, it's smaller. The bill is petite. The bird on the left is a California gull in winter. 
The bird on the right is a mew gull, M-E-W, in winter. Um, notice the legs, neither one of them has pink legs. But again, that size and the, the red, round head and the smudgy eye of the mew gull makes it look different than any other gull in the flock. Let's move on to the next slide. We'll keep moving on these. Now, what about this bird on the left? Yow. He looks <laughs> like, he has one nasty looking gull. <laughs> Okay, you see the, they got big pink legs, so they, they both do. But this bird on the left is a big husky bird with a, kind of an evil looking yellow eye and a big heavy bill. And again, see the gray, see the gray on the, on the neck and the nape? And look at the, the shade of gray in the, uh, uh, in the back, in, uh, on the wing covers, on the backs of the wings. That's a real pale, both of these birds are much paler than our anchor bird, the year round Western gull. So that you can separate them out as a pale bird. The bird on the left is a herring gull. Comes down, it, it breeds north above our Western gulls, way up into uh, British Columbia, starts around Puget Sound and breeds up north. The bird on the right, look at that bill. Compare that bill, again, use the flock, embrace the flock. The bird on the right has a relatively straight bill. The bird on the left has this big, what they call a goddess, this big uh, uh, protuberance on the lower bill. Bird on the right doesn't. The bird on the right is a Thayer skull. So Thayer's go. So we can we can use a, just a couple of features to start to make some kind of sense out of the adults. Okay, let's move on, Tim. Good. The goals are gone. All right, Tim, take over. <laughs> okay. Tell everybody it's safe to come back in the room. <laughs> Wake up, everybody. Yeah, we're done with goals. <laughs> No, thanks for that, David. Uh, that's the way I learned them. My first thing I did was learn glaucous wing gulls because they were the only ones without those bl black tips and that made them easy to ID and then just add a gull every year. Somebody just asked, what's an Olympic gull? I had that question years ago when somebody wrote that down on a CBC checklist and I couldn't find it in the database. An Olympic gull is the nickname given to hybrid between Western and glaucous winged gulls. They do hybridize, which <laughs> just because gulls weren't confusing enough. I want to say, you know, and I'll just one last thought. Gulls are incredibly fantastic. What other bird that we've looked at tonight commonly hybridizes with its cousins? None of them. <laughs> no, they don't. You don't see a, a, a a Western bluebird and a hermit thrush interbreed. You don't no. see a black Phoebe and a Says Phoebe breed, but gulls somehow, you know, the restraints are off. I, and, I'm a little uh, disturbed that you think that's a good thing. Well, it's just an incredible thing. How do they do that? It's <laughs> and 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 why does no one else? Why does no one else do that? Uh, we can uh, talk about is, this. The answer is long and involved. We, uh, uh, we'll have to we'll have a discussion about that actually. Yeah, I would love to because phylogenetically the gulls are, are, are pegged as having evolved much earlier than uh, the passerines. So they're a more primitive bird and yet they seem to have, uh, some of them seem to have evolved uh, very rapidly. Uh, yep. fairly... Okay, enough of that. Sorry. <laughs> I, I like gulls. I'm sorry. We'll get into evolutionary biology later. Uh, okay, we're going to get back to the songbirds. We're almost done. And uh, this is just kind of a review slide to go through the three common birds that you see fly catching. These are the ones that will perch uh, someplace exposed and then sally out from their perch, grab a bug, and then either go back to the same perch or off to a different perch. So you probably all can identify these birds now since we had them earlier in the slide. We have Black Phoebe on the left, Western Bluebird in the middle, and Says Phoebe on the right. That's just kind of a little review slide. 
And here's our final bird for the night. Uh, uncharacteristically, a single bird. This is the cedar waxwing. Uh, here on the coast, they are generally found, especially in winter, in flocks. And in fact, I have a theory that the reason why they're hard to find is that there's only one flock on the whole coast and all the waxwings are in it. So you either find that flock and find all of them or you don't find any waxwings. Uh, and so they're around, they're hard to find. They have a really distinctive call that is almost impossible to hear because it is so high pitched. I, even if I could play it, I'm not sure I would because it makes a horrible sound through the computer speakers. Uh, and a lot of computer speakers won't even play it because it's too high pitched. Uh, if you can hear it, great, because it will alert you to their presence. Otherwise, what you look for is a flock of birds that are, uh, they fly like a disorganized group of blackbirds. So they fly in flocks, but they aren't all coordinated with each other the way blackbirds are. And they're a little bit bigger than blackbirds, but they have the same general body shape. If you see them perched in a tree and you get a look like this, they're unmistakable with that bandit mask and the bright yellow tip on their uh, tail. That's the cedar waxwing, a marvelous little bird. Somebody go find that flock for me on the, on the fork bag Christmas count. Well, that does it for our presentation for tonight. I wanna to thank everybody that contributed those photographs. Uh, we had a lot of contributions and I really wanna thank David for helping me out with explaining all these birds. And uh, big thanks to Nikki Houts for, she is our Zoom czar, but we're managing the whole room and uh, getting this all pulled together. If there's any last questions in the chat, I don't see any. Uh, we got a few minutes, we could answer some. And otherwise I will just say, <clears throat> again, reiterate that we've been uh, working pretty hard putting together some videos, shorter, uh, videos breaking up the taxonomy a little to help you identify some of the more difficult birds on the coast. Uh, so I've got one up today on ruby crown kinglet and Hutton's vireo. There is a video on woodpeckers. Uh, somebody asked earlier if we didn't have a slide for acorn woodpecker and we left that off because they're most people know them pretty well but they're in the, the woodpecker video on YouTube. And I have a series of three on raptors and one on owls. We didn't go into owls at all tonight, but uh, they're another bird that we love to get on the Christmas count. Uh, and this year, because we have no count dinner to interrupt us, we can owl twice. We can go owling in the morning before it's daylight, and then we can stay out after dark and owl some more. And I'm sure many of you will do just that. Thanks, everybody. Good year to participate from home, so don't forget. Oh, yeah. Yeah, should we? Uh, I don't know if I can get back to that slide with the information on the yard and feeder watch, but uh, again. This I think it's on our website, Tim. Mendocino.org. Uh, the, there's a link to uh, both uh, Joanna's uh, email and also to the forms. So if you live in either circle and uh, shelter in place, please count the birds in your yard. It, we're, we're not gonna get there. We're gonna be shorthanded this year. So you, you will really help contribute. Thank you very much. All right, thanks. Good night, everybody. <laughs>